I'm not going to give like a traditional research talk where I present a paper that I'm working on to you or a, a book in progress. I have lots of papers and lots of books in progress. I, and so I could do that. But I thought, given that this is a Brenner and that this is a bit of a different audience, that I would do something that was a little bit more mixed than that. So I will present about some research that I'm currently working on. And I'll tell you a little bit about some of what I'm doing and what I'm finding in that research. Uh, but I'm going to do it through the larger lens of thinking about the kind of nexus between research and public engagement and how that nexus is special and lends itself to allowing us to do uh, work that hopefully the aim is, is important in the world. And for me, a lot of my research focuses on health equity. And so advancing health equity is work that I want to do in the world and I think is important. And so research and engagement are kind of like the twin um, and intersecting pathways that I try to use to do that. Um, and so I'll just kind of talk about how and, and talk through some of that. And, and so I'll talk about my research along the way, but I'm warning you that it's not like a, a traditional research talk. Because whenever I can do something different with a different audience, I try to <laughs> really uh, lean into that. Let's see if that works. Oh, I have to turn it on. You know, it's funny how things expect you to turn them on before they work. No, still not. Doesn't matter. I will use, no, nope, that's not working either. <laughs> we were joking about how technology hates me. Um, oh, click on the slide. And then, yes. Oh, okay. I knew it was probably something simple that I should already know. Um, anyway, just to give you a little bit of background on myself. So a lot of my work focuses on poverty, racial inequality, and those things at the intersection of public policy. So I think a lot about policies like Medicaid, that was what my book was about and what a lot of my work is about, that are especially important for people who are at the economic and racial margins. And I try to understand how we can shape policies in ways that not just meet their material needs, which is really important, but also help to incorporate them into our social and political and civic communities as well. Um, and a lot of that work, because I'm a political scientist by training, I'm thinking about people in terms of um, power and, and, and our, our social and political and economic systems, what it means to make sure that people who, who otherwise, in some ways, we might imagine are at the margins can actually find power and influence within those systems. So that's just like a, you know, 30,000 foot view on some of the things that I think about. So a lot of that work I think about through the lens of health equity, or rather <laughs> what I tend to end up focusing on in reality, given the reality of our world, is inequity, right? Um, and I focus on the structural elements of this inequity, and in particular, in, in kind of in a way that it reflects what I just told you, and this is me confessing about as a political scientist, what I focus on, I tend to think a lot about health not just in terms of like health outcomes, right? How does something affect uh, whether or not you're likely to have a chronic illness or whether or not you're likely to have um, a health problem per se or self-reported health or what have you. But instead, I try to think about social determinants of health, things like housing and neighborhood context and, and, and such. Um, and in particular, I try to understand how power and resources are key factors that, that drive those social determinants and then try to think about what the pathways to change are. And this is where my focus on power really matters because one pathway to change is building power among the people who have the most at stake, right? And the communities that are most affected by social determinants of health and that are at the losing end of, of health inequities, right? So I approach my thinking about health equity through a lens that really focuses on structure and that focuses on on building power in order to change structures. Um, and the idea behind this, I often say, is encapsulated by one of my favorite quotes from Martin Luther King Jr. Um, this idea that compassion is more than giving people resources, although we should do that too, right? But it also is about recognizing where those needs come from, right? Um, as King says, it comes to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. So a lot of my work is about really looking at um, how political institutions and public policy produce the conditions that lead to people living in our near poverty, that lead to various kinds of racial inequality, and then thinking about how we can 
create different conditions that produce a different set of policies and outcomes. So, you know, I want to step back for a second. So I wanted to give you a sense of like, what kinds of things am I generally up to? What am I generally thinking about? And I want to step back for a second, because I think this is important just for understanding the, 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 the things that motivate me. I always try to understand what I what is motivating me, because what is motivating me is dictating the choices I make, the way I spend my time, the way I invest my energy. And I want to be intentional about how I do my work as a scholar and as a person in the world. So I step back and I think, what is motivating me? I'm going to take you on this journey of thinking about that um, as well. So for me, much of this work is very personal, right? Um, I am, I do what some people one time early in my time as a graduate student, a colleague used this word pejoratively and I was like astonished. Uh, what some people think of as me search, right? Like the communities I study, uh, the policies that I'm most interested in are precisely the things that affect uh, people. These are the kinds of communities that I grew up in. Um, the, these are the kinds of policies that affect my family, my friends, people who are close to me. So while I'm a scholar and I'll take theoretical or research oriented approaches to these things, I also think about the things I study as important in a really concrete and practical way, right? So I found this New York Post, which I don't like the Post just to be clear. And I don't think that, <laughs> I don't think that any of us should. So <laughs> let's just be clear on that. But I found this several years ago and I was astonished because it was referencing the neighborhood that I grew up in at a time that I lived in the neighborhood, right? So this was a New York Post article from the 1980s talking about the time, the neighborhood I lived in at that very time. And I found it because one day I was thinking like, huh, I remember living there. And I, I remember as a kid having the vague notion that like it wasn't safe and like maybe this didn't align with like when I watched TV and you saw like, people in safe, happy, comfortable places. I remember thinking, huh, that seems fake. You know, well, I guess it's on TV, so it is fake. But also it didn't align with what I was experiencing. And I remember at some point thinking, was that exaggerated in my mind because I was a child, you know? And I went back, I was like, nope, nope, definitely wasn't exaggerated, right? But also at some point in college, I remember coming across this quote. I took a course on James Baldwin. It was the greatest course and I remember coming across this quote and I've held on to it since. And Baldwin says, the world is before you and you need not take it or leave it as it was when you came in, right? And the world was a particular way when I came in, but that doesn't define what it must be. And I think a lot of how I've imagined my work, my purpose, my career is what can I do to change the world so that it isn't as it was. And, and particularly for people who, I grew up in community with, who I love, who I've lived with, whose lives I care about, how do I make the world a better place for those people? So that's like super high level, but it is also what motivates me to pay attention to the things that I pay attention to as a scholar. I didn't randomly stumble onto poverty, racism, public policy, power, and I don't study them because there's gaps in the literature and we really need to fill the gaps. And I don't study them because they're popular and there's cachet now, you know, especially post George Floyd. I mean, studying racism and health equity, it's like, this is how you get everybody and their mother to invite you to a talk, which maybe some of us might like, like, oh yeah, I'm special, but I don't actually care about that, right? The work matters because it's relevant to people's lives. And so when I came into this work, I remember going to, I worked for a while before I went to graduate school because going to graduate school was not something that I knew was an option. And it took me a little while to figure out I could do that. And I remember when I made the decision to go to graduate school, it was because I had a desire to use that as an opportunity to somehow do good work in the world. And then as I'm a graduate student, I'm getting my PhD, you're a system professor, then you're actually in the thing. And you confront this reality gap that I want to do, I want this work to be meaningful in the world in some way. But the reality is that like, sometimes it doesn't feel like academia or like research is structured in a way that really allows for that or really facilitates that. And I struggled in, with that throughout graduate school and in early um or early on in the tenure track. And I was lucky enough to have advisors in graduate school who, who really did take their work and connect it to the way in the world in profound ways. So I had great examples and great mentors and I still struggled with what felt like a gap between what I was doing most of the time in my work as a scholar and what I hoped 
I could be doing in the world. And so what I'm going to talk to you about for the next few minutes before I'm quiet and then you can ask me questions um, is about work that I found my way to, especially over the last few years, that really allows me to bridge that gap, that allows me to do research that is rigorous and that is sound and that is uh, that, that I care about, right, that reflects the, the things that I care deeply about, um, but also connects with the world and contributes to change in ways that I also care about, right? So I have been and continue to be, like most of us are, on a journey of kind of reconciling those what can feel sometimes like conflicting prerogatives. And I'll talk you through two projects that are very different projects, but that have been sort of part of my process of doing that reconciling. They're not the only ones, and I'm the first kinds of research I've done like this, but there are two that are sort of at the forefront of my mind and my work right now that I thought would be a good way of really demonstrating and talking about both the promises and the challenges, but also the, um, the possibilities and the pitfalls of trying to do research in a way that's deeply engaged with policy, uh, with practice, with community. Um, so these are really different projects, so you'll see that as I talk about them, but I'm going to start with one that's a project that I called the Social Policy Project, That, and I'll share with you data from my research that I've done in Kentucky, although it's a three-state project, and I'll explain that in a second. And then something more local, some research I've been doing for the last year and a half that involves working with um, tenants, people who live in Syracuse and who are renting apartments but facing profound challenges with habitability. I mean, we think of things like lead and asbestos as problems that we used to have and now have been resolved. Most of us wouldn't live somewhere if we knew there were lead, there was lead or asbestos there, if there was mold, if there was a hole in the roof and it leaked on my kids every time it rained. But there are plenty of people here in Ithaca, and certainly many of them in Syracuse that face these kinds of conditions and that find themselves feeling powerless to do anything about it, even though many of those things are as far as policy on the books against the law. And so this project is really about what does it look like to build power among those people so that they can push back against those conditions. But I'll start with the social policy project and I will say my goal is to leave significant time for us to talk. So as I'm talking, if there are things that emerge, questions that you have, things that you find interesting, or maybe not so, or you're like, why did you do that? I wouldn't have done it that way. Uh, take note of those things as I go and we can return to them. So the Social Policy Project is a project that is a qualitative project. Actually, I, I will just say my research is multi-method. Plenty of my research is quantitative. I'm gonna share about qualitative projects today because they just happen to be what I'm working on right now and what are sort of top of mind for me. Um, it's not the case that you can only do engaged research through qualitative work, right? But it is the case that it presents, I think, really unique opportunities for doing that. So this is a study that's funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. It really came from a partnership with a colleague of mine, her name is Carolyn Barnes. She's at uh, Duke University at the policy school there. We're good friends. Um, and she does all of this research on nutritional assistance programs, SNAP and WIC. And I had been doing a lot of research at the time on Medicaid. Um, I invited her to Cornell. She gave a talk at, at one of our seminars in the government department. And we went to dinner that night and there was one other person that was supposed to come and they canceled, but it was like lovely because it's like, great, now it's just us. And we were talking about how we study very overlapping populations, but she was finding that women on WIC, for example, were reporting really positive experiences, that the relationships that they were able to build with caseworkers through that program were actually relationships that they were finding supportive and facilitative to their well being. And I was talking to a lot of women who were on Medicaid who were telling me something very different. And we thought these are the same people, but they're very different programs. And maybe we can learn something about how they're designed and administered so that we can take some of the positives from one and figure out ways of implementing it in another. So we decided like, oh, we wanna do this comparative project. And we just kind of twiddled around for a few years because we couldn't really figure out how to get it off the ground. And then we applied for funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and they funded the project. And it's a three-state study in Kentucky, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina. 
Um, and it's a qualitative study. So we've done over 500 interviews across these three states. On average, you know, we're interviewing people for an hour. We're talking to them about their experiences with these programs and trying to understand what we can learn from people who are actually using the programs about how to improve them. This is just a little bit about like who we interviewed. This is just Kentucky. So we have like hundreds of thousands, if not millions of pages of transcripts from these interviews. And we started with Kentucky. So this is where we've done the coding. So that's why when I do uh, talks now, that's what I report on because we're not done analyzing all the data. Um, and this work I want to emphasize happened largely only because of partnerships that we were able to build in Kentucky. So years before I even thought about this study, I built a partnership with an organization in Kentucky called Kentucky Voices for Health. And um, I would just help them with work that they were doing. They, I met them at first because they were having an annual meeting and they asked me to come and to give a talk on my book at their annual meeting. I gave a talk, it went well, they were like, let's stay in touch. And after that, when they would be taking initiatives in the state that were related to advocacy work for Medicaid beneficiaries, they would reach out to me and say, oh, we're surveying all the Medicaid beneficiaries in the state because we want to learn about how we can help them with this or how we can, you know, mobilize them towards, you know, trying to advocate for X or Y policy. And they would reach out to me and ask uh, for consultation and things like this. And, and I did that. And so when it was time to do this study, I went to them and said, oh, I'm, I'm going to do this study. Originally, actually, I, we weren't going to do it in Kentucky, but that's a longer story. But I went to them, I said, I'm going to do this study. And they were like, we are so excited. We want to work in partnership on this. And that's exactly what we wanted, because we didn't want to plop down in random neighborhoods in Kentucky and start asking people to tell us about their lives and their experiences with government programs. We wanted to be connected to institutions and organizations that they trusted. We also wanted the research to go somewhere, which meant that it would be most effective if we were also in partnership, for example, with folks in government. And Kentucky Voices for Health was a state advocacy organization that had connections in both directions. So they work closely with grassroots organizations and communities to try to build power and provide support to people who were, who were in need as far as um, health was concerned. And they also had close ties to people in the state government. So we spent about seven months uh, working with them to build relationships on both sides of that. And we ended up with a really robust partnership. And some of this was functional for the research. Like it was a lot easier to recruit participants into the study because we had these in-depth relationships with organizations on the ground. But more importantly, it facilitated using the research in an engaged way. And this was especially true when it came to the work that we did with the state government. We invited our state government partners to inform the research from the very beginning they revised the protocol. They would say, well, we don't want you to ask people that question because we think they'll think this. And um, they, we were sort of in communication with them all of the time. And then as we started collecting the data and we started to get information back from people about the nature of their experiences, by this time, we're like into the pandemic, deep in the pandemic. And these government agencies are trying to figure out how to manage these programs in the context of a pandemic. We're talking to people and interviewing them and getting feedback from them about what they're experiencing. And we ended up being able to, in real time, convey this to the state government agencies. Um, and at times that allowed them to make real time changes. And we're, you know, we still have this relationship with them. They held an event where uh, they were engaging some members of their state assembly in December. And I went there and presented the research. Um, and so we've been able to, in a lot of different ways through this project, draw on the voices of people who are experiencing programs, really center and rely on their understanding of their experiences to craft the research, but then take this knowledge and bring it to the places that can be implemented to make change. Um, and the logic of the project was just around centering the voices and experiences of people who, who actually have the most at stake. This is somebody that I interviewed for a different project really early on, and it's a logic that has stuck with me and that I bring into a lot of my work with me, um, this woman said to me, you know what, guess what? 
he who has the gold makes the rules, right? We're living in poverty. We're not the ones who make the rules. And the people who do make the rules aren't facing the same circumstances we have. They don't have the same level of connection that we have. They don't understand the stakes in the same way. And this conversation, this interview really stuck with me. Um, and it really convinced me that making sure that the people who have the most at stake are a part of the research process is a is pivotal, not only for high quality, rigorous research, it is pivotal for that. But if you want to then take the research and move it beyond journal articles or academia, it's even more pivotal. So for this study, um, we really wanted to make sure that we address this. One of the things we asked people in, in our interview was, do you feel like your voice matters? Do you feel like you have any influence over these programs, over these processes? And again and again, people said no. And so we thought, this is an opportunity for us to do something different here. And we wanted to understand the nature of people's policy experiences, challenges that they had becoming eligible for these different programs, accessing and utilizing them, and then the nature of their experiences with the program. And we learn a lot from people. I'm not going to spend long on this. I'm going to go through this quickly. But we had so many conversations with people who were in the most challenging situations, but could share the most um, insightful knowledge with us about the nature of that challenge. And we were able to take that information to government agencies and help them to think about what that meant in terms of what they needed to do. So I'll give you a few examples. So a lot of people talked about gaining coverage. So during the public health emergency, that's what PHC stands for. People who weren't able to have a program like Medicaid before we're now able to sign up because many states, uh, for a variety of different reasons, the federal government gave states more resources for programs like Medicaid. Those states then opened up their, um, their eligibility so that they could streamline eligibility so more people could have the, the benefits, so it was easier to retain and maintain the benefits. And then a lot of people just lost work and got became qualified because they were in situations now that allowed them to utilize these benefits. And people told us again and again about what this meant for them, right? That they were able to be uh, receiving help in otherwise dire situations that, they, uh, that their lives were saved, right? So one interesting thing that we've been able to convey, for example, to legislators in Kentucky is justice. So there's a narrative among more conservative people in the legislature in Kentucky, that you have all these people that got benefits during the pandemic, they got lucky, they rode in on the wave and they didn't really need the benefits. And so we're gonna have all these resources wasted because these people, they don't need it and they're taking advantage of a system. And everyone that we talked to who couldn't qualify before the pandemic and was able to because of special circumstances during the pandemic, went on and on about the kinds of needs that they were able to get met because they qualified during this limited period of time. Many people went and got all their therapy, all their surgeries, they did as much as they could because they were like, we know that y'all gonna take this away when the pandemic is over. So let's get as much as we can while we can. Very much against the grain of this narrative of people don't really need this, but they're moochers, so they'll take it if you give it to them. What we heard was that there were profound needs before that were unmet. And this was a mechanism for meeting them and that people really leveraged it and that it really had a had a had a um, uh, meaning for them in their lives and how they lived and experienced their lives. And being able to stand in front of legislators who are skeptical of people and skeptical of anyone who relies on government benefits and convey some of these narratives from from our data to them has been has been quite meaningful. Um, and then people would talk about really specific things that we were able to work with the state legislature on. So for example, suddenly during the pandemic, there were a lot more remote options, right? And many people talked to us about this. Now you can do more things over the phone or you can do more things online. And lots of people liked it. And so our state partners were like, we wanna get a sense of whether we should continue to invest in this even when the pandemic is over. Can you help us think about this? And it was meaningful to hear that for a lot of people, it, it was very a very positive experience. We were able to hear also from people who didn't have a positive experience. And we were able to get a sense of why. So a lot of people who lived in rural areas told us like, I know that people like this and it's convenient, but we just, I gotta drive 30 minutes to get to a cafe where I can get the Wi-Fi I need to be able to get online and fill this application out. Um, a lot of elderly people said, like, I just don't want to have to interface with technology. Um, and people sometimes talked about this in terms of a desire for social connection. People would tell us about how they didn't like doing everything over the internet, even if they could. 
So there were a range of different reasons why people either had barriers to access or just didn't want to do things that way, wanted to have. I remember one woman that I interviewed who was an older woman who said, when I used to have an appointment with my caseworker, those were some of the only times I left the house. And I would have to get up and get dressed and find my way to the office. And on the way home, I'd stop for lunch. And when I got there, I was at least talking to my caseworker. Otherwise, sometimes I go weeks without talking to anyone. And so there were all sorts of functions that these agencies are playing that may, they may not think about as part of their purview, but really mattered for people. And so we were able to have a conversation with our partners about, well, how do you hold on to this, to the good that many people like this increased flexibility and think remote options are great, but identify the people who need something else, who may be at home, who may live alone, who may be shut-ins, who may be older, who may live in rural areas. And we really worked with this with them on this as they developed their strategy for how they were going to approach um, their remote options moving forward post-pandemic. Uh, another thing that people talked to us about were just like real-time challenges that they were having. This is a lot of text, so I won't read through it all. But this was a woman who shared with us uh, the fact that she had Medicaid. She took her, her, her daughter to an urgent care uh, to get a COVID test and then got a $900 bill for it and had to go through a whole bunch of drama to get Medicaid to actually be charged for that instead of her. And we realized at one point that numerous people were telling us similar things here. We kept talking to people who would say the same thing. And so during our monthly meeting with our state partners, we said, there's something going on. Like Medicaid isn't being charged as the main payer and people are being sent bills. And that freaks people out. Like she was like, I don't know, next time she gets COVID, I don't know if I'm gonna, if I wanna take her to get a test because I might get another bill and this time I might not be able to fight it. And so it was a barrier to people getting the care that they needed. And we were able to engage uh, folks in the state around that. And they, they were like, okay, we're gonna look into that. We gotta find out why this is happening. And this was a problem that they were able to resolve in real time. And similarly, we were able to identify information gaps. Medicaid has a transportation benefit so that you can get help going to the doctor, especially if it's somewhere far away. And a lot of people we talked to didn't know anything about that. They were just like, no, I never heard anything about getting help for trips. You know, I'm taking my son over an hour away every several, every several months for care. And I have no idea that there's a resource that's there to help me with this. And so we were able to identify, this is just one example, gaps in people's knowledge. And again, that's something that our state partners can do something about. Like, this helps you understand how to how to target your outreach to whom and what you need to be telling people that they currently don't know about. So all of this is to say this was a project where by partnering with state organizations, community organizations, and state government, we were able to get not just knowledge and information. Like there's so many papers in this data. Um, Professor Buns from Duke and I are already, we just had one that came out and we already have plenty of others we're working on. So from a kind of scholarly point of view, yes, those boxes are checked. But even in the process of collecting the data, before everything was finished, before all our papers are published five years from now, in the moment, real time, we're engaging organizations and governments to try to make sure that this information can be as impactful in people's lives as possible. So I'm going to give you another quick example. And this is quick because this is very much in progress. And so I don't have uh, data to share in the same way as I did with the project before. This is a really silly picture, but this is literally the picture that our funders, this is a, a another Robert Wood Johnson Foundation grant. And they were like, we want silly pictures so people can see you as like human. And I was like, oh my gosh, okay. This is literally what is on the internet, right? Like, are, are you mad at them for me? Because they took like a bajillion pictures of us. And then I like, they emailed us the link and they were like, the pictures are up guys. And I looked and I was like, you played yourself, you know? <laughs> anyway, that's that's a different conversation. Um, but this is a project that's focused on building power for community health. And it's a study, a study of tenant organizing in Syracuse. And so I had been doing research and have for a few years on, on, on housing um, problems and, and tenants so to try to figure out how do tenants navigate legal housing, um, legal problems with housing. I'm writing a book about that. And so in the course of doing that research, I had been doing in-depth interviews and I did one with uh, this woman right here that's furthest to your left, Palmer Harvey, 
who is one of the um, main people who started the Syracuse Tenants Union. And I talked to her, we had a great conversation. A few months later, she reached out to me and she said, you know what? I know a professor at Syracuse University. And she told me that the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has this grant that supports researchers working with community partners. And we wanna know, And but you needed to have teams of three. We wanna know if you'll work with us. And I said, okay, yeah, let's talk about it. And we talked about it and we, we ended up coming up with this project. But the thing about this grant mechanism that was especially appealing was that our community partner got funds directly, right? So a lot of times like you get all the money and you spend like 95% of it and maybe you can sprinkle some crumbs to your community partner, right? And we still get money for the research but we were able to get substantial funds directly to our community partner and not to do research. So just do the work that they do in the community, right? So Palmer's like, oh my gosh, this is like doubling my budget this year, right? And, um, and then we were also able to use some of our research funds in ways that supported the work that she was doing. So we're doing a study of building tenant power. We were able, for example, to use our funds from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to hire an additional tenant organizer for the Syracuse Tenants Union. And that organizer is going to help us do particular things. So they're gonna keep uh, track of certain kinds of information and data as they're organizing. Um, there's an ethnographic component to this project where we're just being present at community meetings and other places where this organizer is doing, the organizers are doing their work. We're working on, we have focus groups that we're doing right now. This is actually, um, well, this is a description of the project that you do not have to read because I'm telling you about it. Um, and this is the funding mechanism. And this is a flyer uh, for our participants. So we started a few weeks ago advertising for our focus groups because we're starting um, with focus groups now. And it's really interesting, like how many people when we, Posted this flyer just at community organizations all around Syracuse. It was like a flood. I mean, people are like, oh, we're going to talk about, <laughs> we're going to talk about our problems with housing in, in Syracuse. Like, let's do this. And it's interesting, even coming up with this flyer in partnership with, with, um, with a community organization was really different. This is not how I would do a flyer to recruit research participants if it were just me. Like, are you sick of slumlords? Like, I might be like, oh no, maybe that's gonna bias them because they're gonna, blah, 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 blah. I would overthink it, you know? And our partners are like, no, this is the problem. We know this, we're in the community. This is what people are struggling with. If we have some neutral sounding flyer that's like, will you talk to researchers about? They're not gonna come. But if we let them know, we see you, what you're going through, and we want to hear more, then they will come. And that's exactly what happened. Every part of this process, even a part like, what is the flyer gonna look like, has been completely changed because we're working closely with an organization that is deeply embedded in the community, has the respect and trust of the community. And at our focus groups, each focus group, one of the researchers that is there and one, and one person from the Syracuse Tenants Union, um, from our the organization that are that is our community partner is there. And we co-facilitate the focus groups, right? And the information that we're getting from people, I've done lots of focus groups. I think I'm not half bad at them. But we're just getting new and different kinds of conversations because we have our community partner there who sometimes intervenes in the facilitation and asks things that I would never ask. I'm like, oh, I wouldn't have thought of that, you know? And so that partnership is producing, I would argue, better data. Our research will be better because of it. Not because we made a partner who could connect us with participants and we could use this person to get what we wanted, but because it's a real relationship. And they change the way that we approach the research, the way that we do the work, and we help them and facilitate aspects of this for them. So they, for example, have all this data that they've been collecting for years on every action they have, every meeting they have, every person they come into contact with. They do all of these, um, uh, all of these community uh, events where they go and they're doing door knocking and they keep track of everyone whose door they knock on. I mean, they have actually incredible records and no idea what to do with it, no idea how to figure out, is this effective? And they're like, we don't know how to get from where we are now organizing on this local scale to something bigger, something more um, 
fundamental. And I'm like, wow, I'm a political scientist. I think about political organizations and institutions and how to change them. I can help you think through some of that stuff. And we've had conversations where they're just like, wow, this is incredible. And each of us is learning with uh, an humility from each other. And the point is to understand more about what do these processes look like? How do we get from you're powerless in the face of your slumlord who will not do the lead abatement in your apartment that your children live in. And you don't have any other options about where to live and you're stuck there. So you can't just move. You have to figure out how to force your landlord's hand, right? And this is against code and you go to code enforcement in the city and they do nothing. What is the process for changing that? We're bringing people together, trying to think about what their challenges are. And then our organizer is working directly to equip them so what does it mean for us to organize an action and show up at code enforcement, right? And then for us as researchers, we're like, well, what, is the, what, what does it look like when you're, when you're working through a process of helping people to do that? And then what happens, right? We're interviewing people at every stage in addition to the fo focus groups at every stage of the process, including some of the targets of these actions to figure out where is the change actually happening, right? And how is it actually happening so that we can inform this kind of work everywhere and anywhere. Um, so I want to wrap up and I just want to point out like a few of what I think of as like key elements of what it means to do research for equity through public engagement. One is the level of investment of time and resources, right? I keep talking about the funding mechanism because I want to be clear that you often don't get this kind of work for free. It doesn't mean that you have to have a million dollars to do any good work. That's not true. But it does mean that there has the investment has to come from somewhere and it has to be significant. Um, and so it's always worth thinking about how that's going to happen, because it doesn't mean you take money from anyone who gives it to you, because often that ends up changing your direction. One of the reasons with the Syracuse Tenants Union, we decided to do that, go that route in terms of the funding structure was because it, that structure allowed us to give resources directly to our partner. So, yes, we needed resources, but we needed resources that aligned with our values, right? Which is we're going to be on an equitable basis with a partner. If we're getting a ton of money from the, Ar the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, what are they getting? And it cannot be imbalanced or else that's not a true partnership. It doesn't mean it has to be the same amount of money, but it means we both have to be mutually benefiting. Um, and so partnership and relationships are a big part of this. And that's can be a challenge. If you're a graduate student and you got to finish this dissertation, you didn't necessarily have the seven months I had to build the relationship with our partners in Kentucky, right? And so sometimes you have to think differently about the depth of relationship or the nature of the relationship, but there's always an element of relationship if you want to do work that is engaged beyond just your publications or just the academic space. I think humility is a big part of this. You cannot enter into engagement spaces acting like you are the fancy expert who has a PhD and who knows everything. That is how you just make everybody wish you were not in the room. And you can't build the partnership and the relationship unless you really truly believe you have something to learn from people. Humility is just not like, let me feign humility. You know, It's do you really think you have something to learn from people? Do you really think you have blind spots? that will never be illuminated unless you take seriously that there are people who don't have your credentials, who don't have your research training, but who know things that you don't know. And you'll never learn them unless you genuinely engage those people. And then of course, the, val the I think balancing rigor and values. So rigor we is absolutely a focus, right? We're in an academic context. And honestly, I want the research to get it right. Right, not just to tell me what it is that I want to hear or that I already believed. If I think this work is gonna to contribute to helping actually change the world in some way, I gotta be as right as I can be. So rigor matters, right? But then balancing that with our values, the flyer is a perfect example of that. Am I so worried about the flyer, you know, changing the, you know, uh, frightening the research subjects to say particular things that I don't make a flyer that, actually reflects what my community partner knows about the best way to connect with this community. And if, if one value I have is an equitable partnership with my partner, then I can't always be the one who's like, no, no, I know the things. Trust me, I know how the flyer should look, right? And they were right. I mean, that flyer wasn't up for a few hours before we got people signing up for the project. And when they called to do the screening call, they're trying to talk to us. They're like, you know, let me tell you about my level. You're right, he is a slumlord. And you're like, oh, okay, okay. You know, we're, and so, 
just really having yes rigorous re the, the 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 interviews the focus groups we're not just like hanging out and talking to people there's a protocol there's a structure there's a method and at the same time the work is rooted in a deeper set of values that are even influencing those processes right um and so okay that's it i'm going to end there but i i want to make a plug as a last thing just to say I think there are a lot of great institutions at, at Cornell that facilitate this kind of work. Not enough. <laughs> it's a work in progress, but we're here right now <laughs> because Robin Brenner is on campus, right? Um, in my work as Senior Associate Dean of Public Engagement at Brooks, I'm really trying to create more resources, more knowledge, and more pathways for facilitating deeply engaged research um, and for creating research practice uh, partnerships. Um, and, you know, in the centers on campus, I co-direct the Center for Health Equity. And this has been another place where we've really been trying to think about how can we facilitate partnerships with community? How can we facilitate research that's actually going to go somewhere, right? Our, we talk about this all the time. When we talk about the mission center. Becky's here. She knows um, that we're like, is the purposes of our center to get grants? <laughs> Is the purpose of our center to get see lines on people's CVs? We want those things to happen too. But if that's the purpose, I mean, those things just don't wake me up in the morning, right? No, the purpose is we actually want to see change. Health equity, we want more of it. Inequity, we want less of it. And that has to be the metric for every decision that we make as a center. And so I think this is something that we can leverage institutions on campus to do a much uh, to, to, to do this work much better. It's not solo work in any way. It takes support, it takes structure, it takes resources. Um, and I'm glad you're all here today because I know that some of you are doing your own kinds of amazing work, right? And you're facing um, your own challenges and, and need your own support and, and research and infrastructure. And hopefully as a community, that's the kind of thing we can continue to amplify. And those are the kinds of supports we can provide to each other. So I'll stop there. I went longer than I wanted to. Go for it. Uh, if there's any questions, just raise your hand. I don't know if we have any online questions. Oh, nothing so far. Should we? Yeah. Should I do something so we can see the online people? Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you so much for uh, such a great talk. Um, I was just curious if the interviews that were conducted for um, the social policy project, were they all conducted in English? Because I I, um, I saw the demographics and I was just curious if that impacted the work. Oh, that's a great question. So this was something that we really worked hard around. Um, we wanted to be able to conduct interviews in Spanish because there was a kind of sim significant and, and important um, Latinx population in Kentucky that we wanted to be able to hear from. Uh, so what we did was we worked with our with Kentucky Voices for Health, who worked with a community organization that they had a relationship with, to recruit someone onto our research team who was Spanish speaking, but just who wasn't just Spanish speaking, but who was connected to community organizations in Latino communities. So like also trusted in those communities. That person was able to help us with recruitment and they were also able to help us conduct the interviews. It took a lot of work, right? But this was one of the things in general we try to think closely about uh, in terms of how we constructed our research team. So for, for, the, for the Kentucky part of the project, we had six people on our research team who were doing interviews. And four of the six were people who had direct experiences with the programs, with Medicaid, WIC, and SNAP. So we try to think about how do we create a research team that has people on it who understand these policies, who have experiences that are going to allow them to connect in, in respectful ways with the people that we're studying, who can make the research itself more equitable by doing things like being able to interview folks in Spanish and so forth. So it's a, it's a great question. It's the kind of thing that we always need to be thinking about. It's expensive um, and it's time consuming. And I would have never done something like this pre-tenure because it just would have, it's gonna be years before most of the papers related to this are out. And it was almost three years that we were collecting the data for, right? Um, but all of that is doesn't mean that, that that we shouldn't do things that way. Yeah, great question. I see some things in the chat. Should I go to them or? Let's see. Let's... 
Any questions? Ah, okay. Should I just go for them? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So there's one from Aaron Durkin. Is any of your research working towards partnering with local organizations in Ithaca, New York State area? Yeah. If so, how might local organizations get information about getting involved in supporting your work? Yes. Yes, that um, oh, family and children's services. What a that's such a great organization itself. Um, and I and I was on the board for for a year. Um, anyway, so yes, I I almost don't know where to start. Uh, I do too, too many things in general, but a lot of work with local organizations. In particular, um, we've been doing, I, well, I have a long-term relationship with URO, the ultimate reentry organization, but something that we're working on through the Center for Health Equity right now is we're organizing a health equity convening for um, leaders, stakeholders, and communities in Tompkins County. That's gonna be on March 13th. So if anybody is interested, it's gonna be the morning of March 13th from nine to 12.30, we'll give you breakfast if you come. And there are all sorts of people that are gonna be at that conversation. Um, and we're working with uh, CMC, with uh, Cayuga Medical Center, uh, with other health organizations in the county, with um, RETC, it's the Rural Health Equity Collaborative, which is a number of people in, in, our, in our local area who work on health equity related topics, uh, with REACH Medical and with CHEC, with the Cornell Center for Health Equity. So that is a partnership and this convening has been like long in the works. Um, we did research together with them. Um, some of my students work with them on doing in-depth interviews of, of health equity stakeholders in the community. Uh, that they requested and they sort of um, in many ways took the lead on and I simply tried to use Cornell's resources to facilitate. Um, and we ended up producing a report that we're now gonna bring community members together to talk about the findings and to talk about forging a pathway forward. And so we're gonna have um, local, you know, uh, county legislators there, people from, our, from the city government, lots of people from organizations across, uh, across Cornell and actually, for the report that we wrote, we interviewed lots of folks, including people from Family and Children's Services to incorporate their perspectives there. And those folks are going to be invited as well. So that's just one example. Like we'd be here all day if I told you all of them, but the answer is yes, right? I always say that um, a couple of years ago, I really came to this conviction as I thought about it. I realized a lot of my engagement work was in other places. And I thought, what does it mean to be putting all of this effort into creating changes in places and not putting effort into the place that I live, the place where my kids go to school, the place where I am connected to um, and my own welfare and well-being and that of many of the people I'm in community with is connected to. And so I really at that point started to invest more energy into to local community engagement work um, and, and do plenty of that. In terms of how to get information about getting involved? That's a great question. I guess reach out to me is the best way. Although Becky's like, good luck with that inbox. <laughs> no, you should reach out to me. Um, email is, is hard, but I know how to prioritize. Um, okay, there's a second question, another question here from Miriam. I hope I'm getting that right. It says, I think centering the voices of those actually impacted by the issue is a great idea. Do you have recommendations on any other similarly innovative, creative methods of propelling health equity research further? I am interested for developing my own work with affected populations. So this is great. It's it's nice when we're, ooh, sorry, I was gonna scroll down, but I it doesn't matter. It's nice when we're on the same page about these things. Uh, any recommendations for other similarly innovative or creative methods? I mean, there's so many. <laughs> potential innovative and creative methods. And I'm certainly not an expert in all of them, right? Um, and I, I actually, I guess what I would say is like a meta answer to this question, um, which is one way of, of thinking about what the best methods are and figuring out what's innovative is actually by spending time in communities um, and with the populations that you understand yourself to be working um, with. And, and sometimes on behalf of. Uh, often when people are like, well, what do you think the best approach is? Or what do you think the best policy is? Like, I have a ton of ideas that will come to mind instantly for me. And lately I've been trying to stop myself and say, wait a minute, is this a space where I should be the one saying what the best approach is? 
Or is this a space where actually we need to be taking cues from the people who are a part of those populations? So I would say if you're developing work around work uh, around particular populations that you're working with that are marginalized or that are affected by particular processes, and you want to know, how do I propel research in ways that's going to be useful to these populations? I think the best way to answer that is by spending a kind of depth and quality of time with those people in those communities. And often that's where we get the nuggets of innovation and the answers to questions like this. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I don't know anyone's name, so yeah. Hello, thank you for uh, speaking with us today. Um, I'm currently in uh, Professor Brenner's environmental justice class. And oh, just this it. week, we were talking about the history of environmental justice and marginalized groups being typically exploited in academia for research and for science without being involved or compensated. So this was a really interesting, you know, pulling it all together moment for those readings and discussions that we've been having in class. And I was just wondering if, Either you've experienced situations where people or communities have been distrustful of your role as an academic and what you have done either, you know, through community organizations or as, a, you know, your personal decisions to attempt to regain that trust because it's a long and sorted history of distrust that needs to be affected. Yeah, that's a great question, uh, especially being at an institution like Cornell. The answer is absolutely <laughs> you know, I mean, I think maybe the modal, the default posture is one of distrust for reasons that are absolutely warranted, right? It's like, I can't even be mad at you for not trusting me. Here I am affiliated with this institution that you haven't necessarily experienced as an institution that's bringing good into the community, right? Um, I think the one first important step is just acknowledging that, not justifying it, not defending it, <laughs> not claiming that somehow you're outside of it and different but just acknowledging it, like, absolutely. This is an institution that can, and sometimes, forgive me the powers that be, continues to do harm, right? In communities in all sorts of ways. And it's an institution that honestly isn't designed to benefit ordinary people in communities. I mean, there's lots of research, we know this, about Ivy League institutions like this being actually engines of inequality. People who already have a lot of privilege show up here and they get their privilege powered up and they leave with even more of it. And then they go kill it. You know, they do great in the world. Um, and certainly there are also people like me that stumble into, in, into institutions like this and are able to gain advantages as a result of it. So, I mean, I think acknowledging that, acknowledging that a place like Cornell can do lots of good in the world and has the resources and the leverage for that and can also do lots of harm. Right, it's not some kind of unadulterated, um, unalloyed uh, a good, and so I think letting people know that, and then honestly, the other thing that I would say is like being present, uh, being willing to give at points without getting anything back. I was like a part of organizations in this community for years before I ever did anything related to research, and there are still organizations that I work with, and my that relationship has no research component. It has no connection to my career. It's just, I'm here. You know, I wanna do this work. This is important, good work. But if we're always instrumental, like I gotta get this study done, <laughs> like then we don't have time to build genuine relationship. And um, it's clear we want something. And so just figuring out to make sure that you're building reciprocal relationships and taking the time necessary to build trust is really important. It's also really hard, right? Um, and I will acknowledge it's harder for some of us than others. Like, frankly, as a Black woman who like grew up in low-income community, like I, I, I know how to present myself to a room like this and also how to be in totally different spaces and totally different ways, right? And people feel that, they read that, they know if you have no connection to their experiences in their community versus if maybe you're a little bit closer. And so some of us have to work harder than others to do this, but all of us have to work. This is part of the work. Hi, um, thank you so much for your inspiring talk. I had a question about the rigor and values discussion that you were having. And um, so I was kind of thinking about the like flyer that you put up here and how you also mentioned that you, um, the community partner that you were working with sometimes 
um, kind of jumped in on the interviews to ask some questions. So how do you kind of think through the, the balance of rigor and values, especially when something like as when something unexpected happens, um, yeah. like maybe someone jumping in and asking questions. Um, and how do you think through having like academic rigor versus something that could be more, um, could hit home to community partners more? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, one thing I try to remind myself is that one, one thing we're lucky about is that I think that rigor and values are actually most of the time self-reinforcing. Like, I think like, sure, if you jump in and you ask a question that's not on the protocol, then it's not on the protocol. But like often it means we're, we're learning more and that knowledge that we're able to, to gather this that way is better. So it's not, it doesn't often actually present itself as a tension, right? And I, I actually worry about people who worry too much at, about rigor and like, actually, if you relaxed a little, you would get better data. <laughs> um, you would learn more about the phenomena of interest, right? But sometimes we're so worried about controlling the data collection and generation process so that we can adhere to what we understand to be standards of rigor, that we over control it and lose opportunities to learn more than what we have, would have learned before. I mean, at the most basic level, our job as scholars is to learn more about the world. And frankly, I think when you open up spaces in some of the ways that you open them up when you are oriented around values like partnership and equity, you're actually creating opportunities to learn. The, the other thing I'll quickly say is that I'm also honest with my partners, right? Like when we were working with the folks in Kentucky and they would give us feedback on, well, can you add this question? Can you subtract this question? I'm not going to put a question on the protocol that I'm like, you know what? No, like we really can't do that. Let me explain why, you know? And, and often they're like, oh, I never even thought about that. Like, that's a great idea. Like you don't have to feign humility to the point where you're like, I'm just going to let crazy things happen in my research study because I don't want to tell my community partner that I don't think that's a good idea. No, they want you there for your expertise. So sometimes you can say that's really not a good idea. Like that's not the best recruitment strategy, you know, or what have you. And so that honesty, being willing to allow your partner to, to influence you to change course and being willing to push them and be honest with them and not have the like the, the false, like, I can't tell you anything. I have to pretend I'm not an expert when I am. That balance, I think, gets us in the right place where we have both rigor and the ability um, to execute on our values. We're in a couple minutes after one o'clock, so we're gonna wrap it up there. So thank you to Dr. Mitchner for a presentation. Thank you, everyone. These are great questions online, by the way. I'm sorry I couldn't get to them, but I really, yes, they're awesome. <laughs>